I gotta tell you all something. I was wrong. Yes, yes, we must all have a fall from grace at one point in our lives. So, what was I wrong about? People complaining about game sequels not changing enough. Now, I'm a stubborn fuck, so really I was only half wrong. A lot of what these people were complaining about was stupid as fuck. Like reusing animations, having similar functioning combat, not enough attention to detail, reusing maps, when two other maps, one of which was the size of the base game, have been added and each map functions completely differently from one another. That being said, with the release of Spider-Man 2, a lot of people, I've noticed, have been complaining about the prominency of safe sequels in the gaming industry, and honestly, I have to agree. So, I've said it before in one of these videos from this year, but this year has been really interesting for games coming out. Not only has it been a bloodbath on the third party games with shit like Hogwarts Legacy, Baldur's Gate 3, Resident Evil 4 Remake, Phantom Liberty, and Cyberpunk 2.0 update, Jedi Survivor, and the Dead Space Remake, but it's also been a bloodbath on the first party scene, with each of the console manufacturers releasing their biggest games of the goddamn decade so far. Nintendo with Tears of the Kingdom, Xbox with Starfield, and PlayStation with Spider-Man 2. And it just so happens that all three of these games are essentially sequels that are extremely derivative of what came before. Josh! Josh! Starfield is a new IP, it's not a sequel! Bitch, sit the fuck down, Starfield is literally Fallout in space with more menus, bloat, and loading screens. You cannot convince me otherwise. But yeah, and honestly, at face value, there's really nothing wrong with this. People love a series of games, they want more content that plays similar to those games, so the developers make more of it. It's simple as that. Tell someone who gives a shit. However, those three games I listed have some very big problems when it comes to them being sequels. I'd honestly go as far to say that they're bad sequels in terms of what I think sequels to games should be. But to start us out here, so you guys can get an idea of what I'm comparing these games to, I think we should talk about not just a good sequel, but I think probably the best modern direct sequel to a game in like the last 10 years. Doom Eternal is pretty much the gold standard for a modern game sequel in my eyes. Probably my second favorite game ever, only losing it to Breath of the Wild, which we'll also talk about later on. But Doom Eternal is absolutely phenomenal. It does all of the following. It improves on its predecessor to make it objectively better. It has enough gameplay differences to make it good in its own way while still giving you a reason to go back to its original to get a significantly different type of game. And it has so many new ideas that make it more of its own thing rather than just another sequel. At first glance, Doom Eternal seems to be another one of those safe sequels that I just listed earlier. But once you actually play the game and really understand it, you realize, oh shit. This game could pretty much be another reboot in the series like 2016 was. It changes, it adapts, and expands. Doom Eternal has objectively better levels. They're more diverse, more colorful, have better environmental storytelling. The encounters in arenas are way more memorable and each one has its own unique idea to it. Doom 2016 has only about like three different types of levels. Mars, Hell, and this kind of factory industrial-like area. While on the other hand, every single level in Doom Eternal is completely fucking different from one another. Doom 2016 has you on Mars for like the first three levels, I'm pretty sure. Correct if I'm wrong, it's been a really fucking long time since I've played it because honestly I don't really like it. Not that it's objectively bad, I just prefer the way Eternal plays more tenfold. But Doom Eternal on the other hand kicks off with Hell on Earth, which is this badass post-apocalyptic wasteland of some random city on Earth that's been taken over by the demons with giant ass motherfuckers walking around as you take out these big ass demons in the second fucking arena. Holy shit. And then after that with the second level with Exultia, it has not one, but two fucking environments that are completely different from one another with this old castle looking place you start the level in to a hell landscape that you finish the level with after you go through a portal. From the level design alone, Doom Eternal is made an objectively better game than its predecessor. Yet, there's still plenty of reason to go back to its predecessor. See, Doom Eternal's pacing is fast. Like, five times as fast as 2016 was. And honestly, for some people, this fast pace is such a drastic change from its predecessor that people prefer 2016 to Eternal, even though Eternal is the objectively better game. There's like two things I prefer in 2016 to Eternal, and that's the music and the gritty atmosphere it builds. Eternal is kind of cartoonish at times, which I like, but I just think 2016 had a better atmosphere. Yet, that's what's so cool about these games. They can coexist with one another with reasons to go back to each one for personal preferences. If you like the slower pace and more of just a power fantasy, 
see, you can go back to Doom 2016. If you like the faster pace with more of a challenge, you can go to Eternal. It's fucking great. And finally, Doom Eternal adds a shitload of new content that's nowhere to be found in 2016. It has a hub now that you can go to in between levels and explore as you wish to unlock different bonuses. It's got a bunch of new mods for your guns like the microwave beam and the plasma gun, the rapid fire for the base shotgun, the fucking grapple hook with the super shotgun which is like the best addition in a sequel ever fucking done. It has a completely different multiplayer from Doom 2016, which I will say I definitely prefer 2016's multiplayer to what they added, but again, contributing to the fact that this game is an absolutely perfect sequel that doesn't completely replace its predecessor while still adding and changing a bunch making it an objectively better game. This wasn't at launch, but now it has the horde mode where you have to fight through a bunch of different arenas of enemies to see how high you can score. It's got the master levels, which I'm not 100% sure if they were in 2016 or not, but they basically remix levels from Eternal, making them still have the same style, but such a different experience from what was before. So yeah, as you can see, Doom Eternal, it isn't a perfect game, but it's a perfect sequel in my eyes. I think it's the gold standard for every game sequel, and more games need to strive to be like this. Some other games that I would say are to this level where their perfect sequel slash successors are Majora's Mask, the original Resident Evil 3 and 4, Resident Evil 7, Elden Ring, God of War 2018, Persona 5, Mario Wonder, which ironically just came out a few days ago as I'm writing this video, and there's probably a shit ton of others that I'm just forgetting about. Basically, the point is, a sequel should be standing alone and have a clear differentiation from its predecessor, but still be better than it in the end. So we're gonna look at three games I listed at the beginning of the video and basically explain how they're way too safe of sequels and completely fail at the job of a sequel, at least in my eyes, because of the specific fundamental ideas that each of these games lack that would make it into a good sequel. Now before I tear all these games in new ones, saying that these are bad sequels and successors does not mean these are bad games. I actually fucking love pretty much all of these, except Starfield. I don't hate it, I just think it's kind of mid. On the other hand, Tears of the Kingdom is tied with Resident Evil 4 Remake as my game of the year, so there's that. But since it's the most relevant now, we're gonna start with Spider-Man 2. Not changing enough. Now if I get a few things wrong here, bear with me because I haven't completely finished this game. See, I don't exactly have a PS5. I was not about to pay $500 for your inferior system to my PC to play one fucking game. So what I did was I leached off of my friend's PS5 and played a few hours of it and watched a full Let's Play online so I know the basic story. And in short, this game is pretty fucking good. It has a decent story. I mean, it's got a lot of controversy now. I don't really feel like getting into it. And it kind of falters in the last quarter. But the first nine hours are really fucking good. That being said, what this game changes is the base game and the scale of the changes being made just barely reaches the mark of not getting called a fucking scam. But here's what they've changed. The new story and side quests, updated graphics, expanded gameplay elements, two new maps that are about the size of the first games but don't really play that much different from the main map, new cosmetics, a revamped skill tree, and that's pretty much it. Now there is absolutely nothing wrong with any of this. Again, like I said at the beginning of the video, people like Spider-Man 2018, they wanted more of it, Insomniac made this. But that being said, the biggest change here is the new story and side quests. That is not good, and I'm gonna get shit for this, but what came out last month? As I'm writing this video, it's like November now, I know, shut up. But Cyberpunk 2.0 and its DLC, Phantom Liberty. The game is fixed. So, those changed pretty much just as much to its base game as Spider-Man 2 does to Spider-Man 2018. I mean, think about it, really. The only thing stopping Spider-Man 2 from being a DLC is the fact that its scale is way more than what's usually expected of a DLC. But even still, Phantom Liberty, I would say, also has a way bigger scale than what's usually expected. Like, it's around 12 hours long and basically redoes the entire second act of Cyberpunk 2077, which is like the main part of the game. The only thing you could say is that Spider-Man 2 has way more expanded gameplay elements than Cyberpunk 2.0 does, which, yeah, you're not wrong. The main thing that comes to mind in 2.0 is they added the new police system, after that with the level scale in combat, and then the revamped skill tree in cyberware. That's pretty much it. Spider-Man 2's gameplay added the on-the-fly switching between Miles and Peter, the new combat mechanic, the new traversal mechanics, the Venom suit, and the one section where you get to play as Venom for like 10 minutes, and the powers each character has. Which is like, a little more. But again, barely! And when the amount of changes you made outside of story and side quests comes down to that even comparable to a DLC, there's a problem. It also comes pretty damn close to just straight up replacing the original, which for some people can be a good thing, but I don't really think it's that good of a thing, cause again, standalone sequels should, well, stand alone. But in the end, you should still have plenty of reason to replay Spider-Man 2018 and Miles Morales for its story, so it doesn't completely replace them. But other than the story, 
it kind of does. So what changes would I make to make this the ideal perfect sequel? Okay, so first we gotta have the combat play fairly different from the original. But the big gameplay twist here is that it's gonna be way more combo based. So basically, those bars you would use under your health bar to either pull off a finisher or heal, those would charge by your combos and how high the streak would be. And if you lose the combo streak, then they all go away. So this makes this risk versus reward scenario where you have to decide whether you want to heal or pull off a finisher or keep fighting to get more health but risking getting hit and losing all that stuff. I feel like that it would make it a lot more interesting and still giving you a reason to go back to 2018 and Miles Morales in case you don't like it. Or shit, get the best of both worlds and have it be a toggle of whether you want the combo based combat or how 2018's was. Another gameplay element I want to add was the obvious implementation of split screen multiplayer. Seriously, come the fuck on. This game would have been fucking perfect for split screen multiplayer. You'd have to do some workarounds in the story but nothing in it would really change that much. I mean, shit, the tagline for this game with all the TV spots was be greater together. Like, what the fuck does that mean if this shit isn't co-op? I don't know. The on-the-fly character swapping is cool, but GTA was doing that shit like 10 years ago. Not as fast, obviously, but still. Now, on the other hand, how many open-world games have split-screen multiplayer? Not that many, especially on the AAA scene. And if you go, oh, split-screen multiplayer is a thing of the past, then have online co-op as well, it's not that hard. And if someone in the fucking comments goes, oh, I don't want a Resident Evil 5 scenario where I have to carry a helpless AI to the end of the game, then have it exactly like it is now where you can do the on-the-fly switching, but have the option option for co-op. It's so fucking simple. But yeah, those are the changes I'd make with the game to make it more of its own thing. They have issues of their own, but again, I'm not trying to make this game perfect. I'm trying to make it more of what a sequel is supposed to be and have it stand on its own. So this way, if you don't like combos, the multiplayer, you can go back and play Miles Morales in 2018. <sighs> we still have two more of these fucking things to do. Starfield changes for the worse. Pronouns! Be smart on the internet, they said. You're an adult now. You can't use being a child as a crux anymore, they said. Starfield is mid. I said it. I barely made content on the game at all leading up to its launch because outside of the PlayStation fanboys losing their shit about it, I could not give less of a fuck about this game. It looked mid, it runs like shit on console, and somehow even worse on PC. And aside from the aesthetic and style of this game leading up to launch, it did not interest me at all. I've never liked a Bethesda RPG. I don't like Skyrim because I'm not into fantasy. I didn't like New Vegas because its gunplay was like firing a fucking dildo as a gun. And Fallout 4 is... well, Fallout 4... Turns out, I was absolutely right, because this game is pretty much just a really padded out version of Fallout 4, with a somehow even less interesting story. Now, I haven't finished it, so maybe I'm reading the game wrong, from all the people who say the game gets good after 20 hours. Yeah, fucking right. It's, it's just so fucking boring. I'm like 15 hours in, and we're looking in temples for space powers? Okay? Like, what is this shit? The RPG mechanics are fine, again, I'm not too far into the game to notice anything, but like, apparently it only has one ending and then it tells you what happens to all the characters you met playing the game after you finish it, which would be cool if I gave a shit about any of the characters, because they're so fucking boring and two-dimensional. They're either strictly good or strictly bad, nothing else. And that's just not interesting when you're trying to get me to care about their fates in the ending. The RPG mechanics seem to be slightly deeper. Then Cyberpunk's, which is embarrassing to say the least, because Cyberpunk I wouldn't even consider to be a real RPG from how little consequence there is in that game. Like I hear how New Vegas has all these fucking insane RPG mechanics that still to this day are way ahead of their time where you can kill all these super important NPCs if you want and it'll completely change how the story goes about and it's like, whoa, this is crazy. Why is it fucking 2023 and Bethesda themselves can't even begin to compare what one of their own studios have made? What the fuck? This game somehow fails to innovate on anything that came before and makes changes in all the wrong places at the same time. I don't even know how that's possible because all of this shit would be fine if the exploration was good. Which in Bethesda games, the exploration is usually really good. But in Starfield, it absolutely fucking blows. What they call exploration in this game is just fucking menus and loading screens. You get in your ship, choose the planet you want to go to, load into the planet, walk around for 10 minutes, realize there's literally nothing there aside from the same fucking power plant you already explored two hours ago, and then repeat. That's the exploration. And that's what's funny, because this is not exploration. This shit is like Ubisoft or PlayStation open world games where they just tell you where everything is instead of having some symbol in the world for you to find it yourself, except this is even fucking worse because it is quite literally just fucking flat ground in between your destinations. At least in like Ubisoft games, you'll probably find other points of interest along the way. At least in Ubisoft games, when you go to a different point of interest, you know it's gonna be a point of interest you haven't seen before. This shit has none of that. Why the fuck couldn't we just have like one, two, or three planets that were all handcrafted by Bethesda instead of this procedural 
digital generation garbage. Oh, but it's realistic. Who gives a fuck? It's a video game. It's not supposed to be realistic. It can have some realism, but when you commit to realism so much to the point where it doesn't even make the game harder, it just makes it fucking boring, then you're making a piece of shit. Thank fucking God I stopped making content when I did, because I would have said some stupid ass shit and have embarrassed myself even more than I did already. So what were the changes that were good about this game? The ship combat and customization was cool. I wish we could do more with them outside of just fighting in them and opening menus in them. The RPG mechanics are better than Fallout 4's, but obviously that's not saying much. I like that the protagonist will just shut the fuck up now. They were annoying as fuck in Fallout 4. Again, I really like the aesthetic of this game. The variation of style in the main four cities is really cool. I liked the fact that they added pronouns and it pissed off the thumb man on YouTube. Fucking pronouns! The worst part though is that it had so much fucking potential. Again, since New Vegas came out, people have praised the role-playing elements in that game and saying how superior they are to every Bethesda game coming after that, and they still don't change shit to these. It's insane. Let me be a fucking psychopath and murder the entire Constellation team. Long story short, Bethesda committed to realism way too much. Like, remember when Breath of the Wild came out and people were bitching about the weather effects and how your weapons break? Imagine that where it's only mildly annoying in that game, but put that shit in every fucking corner of this shit. That is Starfield, and make it unable to run at 1080p 60fps on my fucking 3070. Jesus Christ, and there is so much other shit wrong with this game that I can't even begin to mention, like the inventory management and how hilariously small it is, the AI sucking balls, the weapon design being boring as fuck, the facial animations looking like they were ripped straight out of 2012. Now, is this game a complete piece of shit? Not really. I mean, I feel like there's a good game in here somewhere. I hear about the new game plus stuff and it actually does sound really interesting. It's not really buggy, some of the environments look really pretty, the ship customization is really cool with how detailed it is, but where I am right now with what I've played, yeah, the game is kind of a complete piece of shit. I just want to hold off complete judgment until I've gotten a little bit into a new game plus playthrough to see how substantial the content there is. I can't believe I'm saying this, but Starfield managed to make Cyberpunk and No Man's Sky at launch look like finished games. In the meantime, what would I change about this game to make it a better sequel, or successor in this case? So, like I said, just have three planets to explore. Nobody gave a shit that the game had over a thousand planets in it, because if those planets are boring as fuck, you're not gonna want to go to any of them. Honestly, those three planets that I said you should have to explore don't even need to be, like, full massive fucking planets. They could be, like, islands on the planets you can go to, but have all the content on those planets actually handcrafted, because having the repeated points of interest completely turns you off from wanting to explore explore at all. Like, think of how repetitive Ubisoft towers get, but now have those towers copy and pasted in literally the exact same way. Expand the RPG mechanics, give it more varied endings, do what New Vegas did, but obviously modernize it. Have special weapons that fit the style, like how Cyberpunk has all these insane looking different weapons, like the smart pistols, the pistol that talks to you, the fucking vibrating dildo that vibrates your controller, Johnny Silverhand's gun with its different reload animation and melee attack, shit like that. Make the AI better, oh my fucking god, give me consequences for my actions, make the inventory bigger, and obviously as the most important thing, don't commit to realism as much. It's just not fun. This is a fucking space game where you get stupid space powers. Let it get fucking crazy. But yeah, that's about it for Starfield. This is definitely the most flawed game here, so a lot of it was just me ranting about the core issues of the game, just kind of sucking dick in general. But we only got one more of these, so let's continue on to Tears of the Kingdom, replacing the original. What? Josh criticizes Tears of the Kingdom? I know, I know, it's insane. Cause for the record, I do think Tears of the Kingdom is an absolutely phenomenal game, easily one of my favorite games to come out this generation, probably my game of the year, and I mean, it's a sequel to my favorite game ever. How could I be even begin to dislike it? But it does have a flaw which it's not a very good sequel, at least in my eyes. And that's because of the fact that it completely replaces the original. Everything that Breath of the Wild did was done here in Tears of the Kingdom, but better in every way. There was more to explore, the exploration is better, the combat is more advanced, you can make your own shit now and make vehicles, the puzzles I'd be thinking more outside the box, the apocalyptic environments actually look like they've been going through shit, the dungeons are more varied, the final boss, ooh, the final boss, fucking perfect. Yeah, literally my only problem with this game is that it's too good to the 
point where if you're thinking about playing Breath of the Wild, you might as well just skip it and play Tears of the Kingdom. Unless you really want to know what happened in the first game, which honest to god, there's really not much to it. Tears of the Kingdom makes pretty much no reason to go back to Breath of the Wild, which means it's a great game, and obviously better than Breath of the Wild, but not as good of a sequel. Because everything here is just Breath of the Wild expanded upon. And that really sticks out like a sore thumb in the Zelda franchise especially, because there is not a single mainline Zelda game that does that. Each new game in the series has had a massive change to its gameplay until Tears of the Kingdom came out. They've all been able to stand on their own and be their own thing. You don't call Majora's Mask Ocarina of Time 2, even though it uses the same engine and at face value looks exactly the same, because Majora's Mask plays nothing like Ocarina of Time. Tears of the Kingdom, on the other hand, I mean... I wouldn't really blame you for calling it Breath of the Wild 2 from how much it just uses stuff from that game and builds upon it. And it's not like Tears didn't add enough content, because it absolutely did. Again, two new maps, one of which is the size of the base overworld map, 150 new shrines, and all this other shit that I really don't even feel like talking about. And neither is the stuff that it added bad, it's just the content added here was stuff from the base game but now expanded upon. You could say, oh well the powers are the main thing that's different in this game from Breath of the Wild. And while that's true, there's still just more of an expansion on that of Breath of the Wild, but instead of the specific powers, they expand on the idea of the powers themselves and make them way more useful. Even the champion abilities are different, and more balanced versions of the abilities in Breath of the Wild. Again, there is nothing objectively wrong with what they did in Tears of the Kingdom. They just took Breath of the Wild and made it the best game possible it could be, which from a certain angle, I really appreciate that. But as someone who fucking adores Breath of the Wild, again, my favorite game ever, it just kind of sucks to see it replaced like this. Like, I feel insulted, yet loved at the same time. It's weird. So now, what would I do here? Have both of these games be open-ended in their own way. Leave Breath of the Wild with its focus on the open-ended exploration, and give Tears of the Kingdom a focus on open-ended puzzle solving and combat. So Breath of the Wild went for a more general open-ended approach, which I love, but Tears went for the exact same approach. So what if it went for a more linear approach, like classic Zelda, but with the same physics-based puzzles and combat that both of these games have? And from the first few trailers, it seems like Tears was going to have a more linear approach, and then the game came out and that was not at all the case. So, yeah, make it more linear. First off, we have to get rid of two of the maps in the game. Since, obviously, we can't just have the base game's map, we can just cut out the base game's map in the Sky Islands, and we completely overhaul the depths, give you way more to do down there, get rid of the darkness stuff, cause that's not really what we're going for here. I'd say basically just make the map like a modern rendition of Termina from Majora's Mask, and what you gotta do is in the opening cutscenes, Zelda actually falls now, she doesn't get transported back in time, she falls down into the depths, and Link chases after her, and then it turns out she got captured by Ganondorf, so Link has to rescue Zelda, and find a way out of the depths. Have specific quests you have to do in order, obviously we'd be cutting the flashbacks and finding those out in the open world, but I don't really think anybody's gonna miss those. Probably cut out the Koroks too, since again, this has less of a focus on exploration and more on puzzles and combat. Have more of those classic dungeons in the game. As much as I love the shrines and tears of the kingdom, I think you're gonna have to take them out and instead have way more dungeons and tears, like double the count, or if you really want to get crazy, since this would still be an open world game, fucking triple the count and have some of the dungeons be optional. Not all of them, or even most of them, just like like maybe three, and then bring back heart pieces and implement them into the world, like how they are in classic Zelda where you have to solve a puzzle to get them. Now we gotta talk about the powers cause I've been back and forth of whether you should keep them or not, and I'm thinking, yeah, keep the powers, they are so fucking good, they make puzzles so much better, it's not even comparable to Breath of the Wilds, and they make the puzzles way more open ended, so you'd make sure like each puzzle has four or five solutions to it, and yeah, the rest should be good. This way, if you liked the open ended exploration, go anywhere, do anything shit in Breath of the Wild, you still have that game to go back to, but now if you want to play the more open-ended puzzle solving in Tears of the Kingdom, you have that to go back to. Also, I think the combat should be improved. I'm not sure exactly what should be changed that isn't already changed because of the new powers, but just have it be more tactical and have you like have to think about it more instead of just mashing Y, make enemies like a timed puzzle of their own. And yeah, I think that's pretty much all the changes I'd make. So that's how I think these games could have been made better sequels. Again, this stuff is not necessarily picking up the flaws in these games. It's to make them better sequels. Like, with the Tears of the Kingdom idea I had. I still think the Tears of the Kingdom we actually got is still a better game than the sequel I had in mind. I only brought it up as a way to make Tears of the Kingdom differentiate itself more from Breath of the Wild. Spider-Man, I think with either one you could make a fair argument for what could be a better final product. With Starfield, yeah, that was basically just me fixing the issues of that game to make it a better game, but also a better sequel. So that's the end. Overall, I think all three of these games are fine enough, none of them are absolutely terrible, and even though I 
tour starfield a new one i still think that all of these have some potential in one way or another so i guess the question you've had with the video is why the fuck does this matter and honestly it really doesn't as long as the game is still good whether the game is a good sequel or not doesn't really matter i just don't really like the idea of games not changing enough about them or being built so heavily on the bones of their predecessors that they outright replace the predecessor so as a last example i'm gonna leave you guys with probably the most interesting example of another golden standard of a sequel which it's actually for a game i really don't like that much and that is resident evil village what this game did was make it not only a sequel to resident evil 7 but also a spiritual successor to resident evil 4 at the same time and what it does is combine elements from each game to make it this frankenstein of a game the style and camera of resident evil 7 yet with the atmosphere and gameplay of resident evil 4 it's actually really cool how it does this as much as i dislike village it tries to make the best of both worlds across these two games and while it doesn't really succeed in that i can still appreciate it for what it was attempting to do it doesn't replace the originals but creates something new altogether and just its own thing the only thing i could say is that it isn't really better than either of its predecessors but i'm not really worried about that with this topic in mind right now so yeah game devs make better sequels have them be more of their own thing and uh don't make them bad. Look to shit like Doom Eternal, Majora's Mask, Resident Evil 3, 4, and Village as an example. My work is done here. So make sure you like, subscribe, follow my Twitter. Don't join my Discord because I deleted it because that shit was cancer. Thank you all for watching and I hope you all have a great day.